Ooh. Are you having a Christmas with Jesus? What's your greatest memory of Christmas? I'm not going to go around the room and ask. I just want you to ponder that and think about that for a moment. What is your greatest memory of Christmas and why? How did you come to the conclusion and determine to make that decision that this is the greatest moment of Christmas? Not this, but whatever you have determined it to be in your mind. We all have them. And sadly enough, factual-wise, statistically-wise, more people have bad memories at Christmas than good. And I find that very interesting because as Christians, it should be one of the greatest events for us to celebrate the birth of Christ. But what is your greatest memory of Christmas? That's your first part of your question that we're going to answer as we go through the message today. But the second part, how did you come to that conclusion? What made it so great? What made it so great? I have a lot of good, good memories, especially as a childhood, especially as an adult. In fact, I guess I'm not statistically normal. I have no bad <coughs> memories of this day at all. Ginger and I were just talking about this the other night when she was a young girl. She grew up in Chicago, and she said, you know, one of the greatest memories I have is to remember when we went downtown Chicago and you'd get to see Christmas in the lights of the windows of the businesses. You know, it was just a fabulous sight. Now that's a cool memory. What is yours? You know, most of mine as a childhood growing up, we went to church on Christmas Eve and we did the parts and the plays and we recited our, our you know, you stood there and you said your part and went home and opened presents and then we did that with our children, so that's a good memory. And then even as we grew... We still spent Christmas with family. I have many, many good memories. What's yours? What is yours? And if you're thinking of it right now and you go home today and have Christmas dinner, I want you to talk about that. But then the second half of it, why? Why? We're going to talk about wise men today. What deems a person to be wise? You take in knowledge, you take in information, and the decision you make if it's the right one, deems you a wise person. Only until then are you wise. If you take in information, if you take in knowledge, but you make no decision or a wrong decision, are you still deemed a wise person? No. You're only wise after you make a decision based on the information that was taken in. We have two verses in Scripture that we call the wise men. We know very little about these guys, almost nothing, but we call them the wise men. Why do we call them that? You ever think of that? Why do we call this group, band of, of nomads that traveled to see Jesus, wise men? So today, we're going to worship with those who were wise. Don't you want to be in the company of wise people? You do. You want to be in the company of the people that make good decisions, do you like to hang around with somebody that's made a lot of bad decisions? We like wise people. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, you know what, I've made a lot of bad decisions. Does that make me unwise? Not necessarily. I'm going to teach you what it means to be wise. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judea territory, this was King Herod's kingship. Herod was, was ruler, which is a Roman ruler, in Israel's home country. Uh, a band of scholars arrived. Notice what they're called? Scholars. I'm reading out of the message translation. A band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east, and they asked around, where can we find and pay homage to this newborn king of the Jews? Now, there's so much just right there. Number one, they're called scholars. Number two, they're recognizing that this baby was born as a king. Where did they get that? We'll learn. We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. Where did they come up with that? A star shows up in the sky, so what? But they said, we've seen the star that signals his birth, and we're on a pilgrim to what? Worship. When the word of their inquiry got to Herod, Herod became terrified. 
Last week I talked about everybody in this Christmas story became afraid when this birth of Jesus happened. The angels come and say, fear not. And not Herod alone, but almost all of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religious scholars in the city and asked. Now, I could have a sermon series on this. Look at this sentence. Herod, non-believer, ruler of this territory, gathers all the pastors of the churches, all the local priests, and says, you know, what's going on? Well, the priests should have known. They were scholars in the word. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him, Bethlehem, Judea territory. The prophet Micah wrote about it plainly. It's you, Bethlehem, in Judea's land, no longer bring up the rear. From you will come the leader who will shepherd, rule my people, my Israel. Verse number 7 and 8. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with these scholarly men, the scholars from the east, pretending to be as devout as they were devout. He got to them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. He got them to tell him. Then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, Go find this child. Leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word, and I'll join you at once in your worship. Verse number 9. He instruct, inst, instructed by the king, they set off. And then the star appeared again. So it led him to this point. Must have went a little dim, but there it is again. The star appeared again, the same star they had seen in the eastern sky. And it led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. So the star moved. It was their guide. And it led, it, led them to where Jesus was. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. Verse number 11. They entered the house, saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome. They knelt and worshipped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented him gifts with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse number 12, And then in a dream they were warned not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route. They left the territory without being seen and returned to their own country. We don't know how many wise men they were. We don't know where they were from. We don't know what they rode on. You know, we, we have these three wise men standing beside the manger. We, we don't know any of that. We don't even know if they walked, they rode camels, donkeys, horses. We don't know anything like that about these guys. But what we do know from Scripture, they were wise because they had studied the Word, because when this star appeared, they knew what was happening and they followed it. What deems you wise? Why were these, they were wise in their decisions. That's why I asked you what's the greatest memory you have of Christmas and why, because there's a decision that you made why it was a good thing. Were deemed wise in their decisions. They were wise in their decisions. Why? Because they were seeking him. Seeking him. What I find interesting when you read these few little verses about the wise men, nobody else was. Nobody else followed the star, and we, we really believe, many scholars believe they were probably from Babylon, because everything that they know seems to have come from Daniel. Daniel prophesied all of this. Let's hypothetically say, since we don't know they were from Babylon, which is about 300 miles, they did not get there in a couple days, in a couple hours. It may have been a year. Then some scholars say that the star was probably a comet or a flash in the sky. That's not true either because it would have been a flash and it would have been gone. But we know the glory of the Lord shines. How did Israel get led by night? Fire by night, star by day, light by day. Ezekiel prophesied that there was a light in the temple. David prophesied that when they dedicated the temple, it was so filled with the glory of the Lord. We know that God shines his light. We know that it can happen, and we know that these people followed it. What I find interesting today is everybody wants to follow something, but they don't want to follow Jesus. They want the joy of this worship without worship. They want the joy and the excitement of Christmas, Jesus. Don't you love the candy cane thing? 
We want all the excitement, and we want that. And, and Jesus finally gets that guy all worn out. And he brushes the snow off of his head, and he says, you're missing it. Just, just spend time with me. What did the wise men want? They wanted to spend time with Jesus. Herod, this man, that they seek as a king and trusted as a king, was wicked. If you do any research at all about King Herod, he was nuts. Killed three of, the, three of his wives, killed three of his sons, because they were a threat. So anybody that was a threat to Herod, he just lopped their head off. Not only that, but Herod had men lined up to kill innocent people upon his death so that there would be crying at his funeral. Herod was a crazy man, and the wise men went to him thinking they could trust him, but who did they trust in the end? God. Because God told them not to go back to Herod. In spite of all the things they had trusted to do, they still listened to God. And that deemed them wise. God says, seek me and you will find me. Look at what he says in Jeremiah 29, 13. I love this verse. I love this verse. Seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, how are you seeking him today? You know, the very fact that you came out in icy roads today tells me you're seeking him. It tells me that you want something that Jesus has. Some of you don't even know what you want. Some people that seek Jesus have no idea what Jesus can give them. Just like the guy with the Christmas presents, I can smell this one and tell you how much it costs. We do those types of things and we miss what we're seeking. And yet the wise men knew. How do you seek him? It's through the ministry of the Holy Spirit because he seeks you. Let him lead you to him. Let him lead you to him. I'll guarantee if you seek him on your own power, you'll seek him in the wrong way. But if the ministry of the Holy Spirit, like it touched the wise men, took those guys on a journey and led them to him. Are you letting the Holy Spirit lead you today? You know how many times I've gone over here and I was supposed to go over here? Besides a very loving wife and a, a woman that can discern and tells me that, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. But guys, we still do it, right? Okay, so guys, come on, let's be honest. How many times have you done something that your wife said no? Amen. Amen. Just this last week, sitting across the table with a young couple, and I was telling them about the difference in the brains, you know, that her brain was a ball of wire, and from the moment she was born, that spark started, and she started crying. She's like, oh my gosh, this just explains everything. <laughs> And I, I said, it helps, doesn't it? And I said, not only does it help, but your husband doesn't have that. And she goes, I know. <laughs> and he's like, hey, are you on my side or not? I said, no, I'm on your side, but listen to me. Her brain doesn't shut down. Yours is always shut down. And when, when you go to work, you pull open the work box. Remember the message on all this? And I was just giving it to him. And I said, when, when he has his work box open and he's at work and you call him at 2 o'clock and say, oh, honey, do you love me today? And I said, what? And, <laughs> I said, when he's at work, he's not thinking about you. And she started crying again. And she goes, but I think about him all the time. I said, I know, remember? Mm -hmm. Your brain doesn't shut off. His does. When he comes home and he pulls out, open the honey box, and then he'll be all nice to you, and then he'll shut that and go sit on the couch and pull out his nothing box. And she goes, oh. <laughs> do you know us? <laughs> I said, that's how God made us, different but good. And then I said, when he's got the nothing box open, he's watching TV, and you come in and say, wanting words of affirmation, and oh, he's going to say something loving to me. What are you thinking about, honey? Nothing. <laughs> and she was just like, shocked. But I said, here's the thing. God has built into a woman the ability to discern, and you need to tap into that, guys, because when you don't know what to do, she does, and she probably knows what you're thinking. I'm sorry to burst your bubble this morning, guys. But she probably knows what you're thinking, and because she knows what you're thinking, honor her and say, what do I need to do here? And now he's crying. And he goes, is that how it really works? And I said, yeah. 
Whose mind do we need to tap into? The mind of Christ. Seek me, find me when you seek me with all your heart. How do you seek him? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not that we're different, that guys don't seek him, we do, but he's given women the ability to know and to hear and to understand at a different level. And then he brings two together and you become one so it can function and flow the way it's supposed to be. If you're seeking Jesus through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you will find him. Are you doing that? What's the greatest thing you remember about Christmas? Maybe it's the fact that you found Jesus on Christmas Eve. And it isn't that you found him, it's that you finally sat still long enough that he was able to speak to you. And when you let him speak to you, you oh, that's why Jesus came, to take away my sin. And that's why I worship him clearly. That's what scripture says, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Are you seeking him correctly? Seeking him to worship him? You ever think of that? I mean, in your quiet time, okay, you just got done with a conversation with your wife. You're, you're open, and you're saying, no, I got my nothing box on, but okay, you realize she wants to talk, so you close the nothing box, and you open your honey box, and you sit on the couch, and you put your arm around her, and, and you have a time of coming together and seeking him. How do you do that? How does that happen? It's when you're a student of the word. What did, what did Jesus say at the end of the video? Just, just spend time with me. What, what do we have right now today to spend time with him? The word of God. You can open the word of God and read one verse and you're spending time with Jesus. And when you spend time with Jesus and you have one verse, the ministry of the Holy Spirit works and you become a student of the word. You are scholars. What were the wise men called? Scholars. Obviously, these guys had the first five books of the Torah. Obviously, these guys knew it. Obviously, they had studied it and understood it and knew this event was going to happen. All of you sitting here today, all of you listening, I pray that you're amazing people because, number one, you're here. And you're here because of what? Jesus' birth. Do you, you're here because you know he was born. How did you learn that? From being a student of the word. And some people write on the coattails of mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or the church. That's not a student of the word. I'm talking about a student of your own time of the word. You want more of Jesus this year, be a student of the word. How many people know but never go? I'm not beating anybody up today. I'm just saying we know of people that know a lot of things. Remember I said you're only deemed wise after you take the knowledge in and then you make a wise decision with what you were taking in. How many people know but they never go? How many people knew the birth of Jesus Christ like the wise men, but they never went? I think there's a lot of people like that in the world today. They know, but they never go. So we can't deem them as a wise person. You are. You're wise. And I know that, because you're here. Let's go back to the man and woman illustration. If she says this, you're deemed a very wise man because you listen to your wife. And all the men said? <laughs> I love all of you too. <laughs> and all the men said? Amen! Because we are deemed wise. Why am I using that as a parallel? I, I can tell some of you are like, oof. Because when the two become one flesh, the church is parallel to the woman. The man is parallel to Christ. And when we play out that relationship in the relationship with our father, with our spouse, we're playing it out in the relationship with our spouse and to us. We learn to listen to him. We learn to listen to each other. That's why. And she's deemed wise when she listens to us. We're deemed wise when we listen to her. They were wise because they listened to God. They were wise in what they brought him. I'm not going to go into great detail, but some of this is absolutely fascinating. They brought him gold. Why would you bring him gold? <laughs> gold is significant as a gift to a king. You bring a king, nothing less. 
You bring a king nothing less than gold. It speaks of a sovereignty. The child was a king. He is Lord of lords. And the gold was used to signify this is a king. They knew that. They brought him frankincense. They brought him frankincense because of his sinless deity, not only as a king, but he is God. They knew that too. How did they know that? They're wise men. They had studied the word. If he's king of the Jew, and it signifies that he is because of the gold, there's only room for one king on your heart. Who is it? There's only one throne in your life. Who's on it? This is a piercing question. Because if you're on it, he's not king. And if you're on it, you're not giving him your best. If he's on it, you give him the best. If he's on it, you bring him the gold and the frankincense because of the deity. The frankincense ingredients was part of a mixture that they used in the temple that they burnt and it would smell and that's where the frankincense proved that this is Jesus in his deity. Do you worship him or do you just admire him? These guys worshipped him. They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh was brought because of his sacrificial death, again, because they had to know all the prophetic signs that this was a king that was born to die. And they brought him myrrh, which was part of the embalming process that speaks of his death. And when they offered it to him, they were saying, you are the king, you are the king of us, and we know that you came to die. Can we say that the Holy Spirit was working in this whole thing? I think we can. Can we say that the Holy Spirit works in us today? Yeah. I love the Holy Spirit. I love Jesus and I love God the Father. I love the Trinity. They just flow and function and work together in all of our lives. And when we seek him, the ministry of the Holy Spirit becomes alive. He reveals himself to us. We study the word. We understand who he is. And all of a sudden, he's king. And he's my God. And I love him because he has first loved me. Without it, I have nothing. And they were willing to travel to worship a baby. Even though the roads are icy, this place should be standing room only today. Last night was a beautiful evening. All the churches across this country should be standing full in the parking lot. Seen clips of the Vikings, or uh, who, who did Green Bay play? Vikings. It was Vikings. People with no shirts on, painted up, cheering at a football game. I don't have any problem with that. Go for it. But do we share that same excitement when it comes to the birth of the Savior of the world? That's always puzzled me, and it'll puzzle me until I take my last breath. You see all sorts of sporting events, monster truck shows, people waiting in line for hours to buy a beer. Had a guy tell me a couple weeks ago, he says, told his wife, he says, well, you, he bought her a beer, they had two beers, and he says, drink that slow. And she's like, why? He says, it costs 10 bucks. I mean, we, we, we do these sorts of things. And yet when it comes to worship our king, if he's king on your throne, you worship and you will do whatever it takes to go and pay homage and say, thank you, Jesus. I bring you my gold, my frankincense, and my myrrh because you're my God. You've been sitting here thinking about the question I asked you. We worship like the wise men this morning. And I want you to think about that question. And I want you to determine why it's the best Christmas memory, because that will deem you wise. And you know by now there's only one answer to that question. I'm going to leave you with a thought. 89 chapters out of the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four chapters devoted to the birth of Christ. Only four. Two verses in Matthew devoted to these wise men who played a significant role. I want you to listen to these words penned by a man named Paul. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. For what I received, what, what did Paul receive? He was taken in his own for three years by the Holy Spirit, and he was taught by Jesus himself. That's what he's saying. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. Okay, here's your first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. In other words, if you want proof that Jesus is alive, he appeared to these 500 people, I'll point you in the direction of one of them, and you can go talk to him because they're still living, if you're going to doubt me. Though some fallen asleep, any time in the New Testament, they never say death because they understand that as a saved person, you only fall asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to, pay homi- as to, as to the one abnormally born. Author unknown. Jesus died for our sins by crucifixion and was then raised from the dead three days later according to prophecy. He was seen by many after the resurrection. He was a descendant of David. He was betrayed. He defined a bread and wine ritual for his followers, and the Jews killed him. The end. The Gospel of Paul is one brief paragraph in this paragraph I just read to you. It arguably has the most important element, the death as a sacrifice for our sins and the resurrection. All I'm saying here, 89 chapters, Four chapters to the birth of Christ, two-thirds of the rest of the New Testament, never mentions it. Paul never mentions it. Paul mentions the death and the resurrection. What am I giving you this morning? I'm giving you information from the Word of God that's going to cause you to be wise. And the more emphasis we put on the birth of Jesus Christ, the more carnal you are. Because where is the emphasis at? Not so much, hey, it's important, virgin birth, we got to believe that. God came down, impregnated a woman, we believe all that. But what is the most significant event known to man? The resurrection. He could have been conceived by the Holy Spirit, walked on this earth, and died. He'd have been just another person. But he rose again from the dead. 89 chapters, four given to his birth, and two-thirds of the New Testament never speak of the birth. They only speak of the resurrection. Now that's exciting. Was Paul a scholar? Yes. Was Paul deemed wise? Yes. Why? Because he was a student of the word. He knew the Old Testament inside out. Pharisee, lawyer, smart man. So I want you to leave here today remembering that in Paul's, parable, in Paul's stories, there's no parables, there's no sheeps, sheeps, there's no sheep, there's no goats, there's no prodigal son, and I didn't catch any of this until studying this this past week. There's no prodigal son, there's no rich man and Lazarus, there's no lost sheep, there's no good Samaritan. In fact, he doesn't even call Jesus a teacher. There's no diving, driving out evil spirits. There's no healing of the invalid in Bethesda. There's no cleansing of the leper. There's no raising of Lazarus or any of the other miracles. There's no virgin birth. There's no Sermon on the Mount. There's no feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000. There's no public ministry of Jesus mentioned. There's no cleansing of the temple. There's no final words. There's no great commission. But you know what there is? Jesus Christ crucified, died for our sins, and rose again on the third day. He said, that's why he came. That's the story. And what do we do? We can't wait to get home to open the present to celebrate the birth, which is awesome. I'm not diminishing that. Romans 10, verse 9, he says, But, Paul writing again, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what did the wise men confess? Jesus is Lord, King of the Jews. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Merry Christmas. Last night we talked about Genesis 3.15, that when God came on the scene and he said, a seed will come, I'm going to impregnate the very woman that you 
deceived and that seed will come and it'll change the course of mankind forever. I said, there it is, Lucifer. Merry Christmas, Lucifer. It's over. And that was the decree. And he did it and he took care of it. And from then on, those who believe. So that's a wise man. Are you wise? That's a wise man right there that confesses Romans verse nine, 10 verse 9. That's a student of the word who worship belongs to this Savior, whose witness belongs to this Savior, and whose wealth belongs to this Savior. Your worship, your witness, and your wealth belong to him. Oh, I give 10, 12%. It's 100% his. I gave him an hour on Christmas morning. 24 out of 7 are his. I went, 24 7 are his. Your life is his. And there's such a joy in that. There's such a peace in that. There's such an overwhelming realization that Jesus so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And you're sitting here today, and you're wise people. You're wise, because you're students of the word. You have heard the word. You have made a decision to confess with your heart and believe, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised this baby Jesus from the dead. And you can leave here today, and you can go home and celebrate Christmas and tear open presents for those of you who are waiting or have already done, and we exchange gifts with each other because the greatest gift that was ever given, it signifies that, was Jesus. Born to die and raise back to life. And I can close my eyes tonight, and if I don't wake up, I know for sure that what he did to his son, he'll do to me. And I can lay down with the peace and the comfort that surpasses my understanding. This baby was Jesus. This baby was the Son of God. And we are deemed wise because we believe it. That's a real Christmas. That's a real Christmas. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Give him glory in the highest for giving us his son, Jesus. Merry Christmas. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart, Ginger and I both. Truly, truly, Merry Christmas to a group of wise people. Very wise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the birth of Jesus. We thank you for his life, his ministry. And Father, as we are students of the word, let us hear the words of those and the, the one man who went before Jesus, his cousin John. And when he looked at him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Father, for those of us who confess to know you, I pray that your spirit settle upon us this morning to remind us that no matter what we've done in our past, no matter where we've been, no matter how ugly it has looked or things we have said, when we turn our face to you and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you settle upon us and you say, it's all gone. It's all gone. I took that away. And there's a new day, there's a new walk, there's a new life. So I thank you for what you've done here today. I thank you for the word of God that brings to our realization of who you are. That you took away the sin of the world in this process. You rose again from the dead. And we can leave here today singing glory to God in the highest and peace and goodwill to men. Father, bless every family here today. Bless them with that peace. Bless them with that forgiveness. Bless them with that joy as they come around the meal and presence as a family. Bless them with the knowledge of Jesus, Lord and Savior, King, who deserves the gold and the wealth and our witness. In the precious name we pray, amen.